I sew burns. Um, I just did a quick review of A and P because the A and P may help you remember the facts about treatment. So just a reminder uh, with the skin that that's our defense against trauma, damage to the body, and infection. So of course infection is a huge risk. It's it's a bigger risk in the second phase, though, so the acute phase. Um, it also helps us maintain fluid electrolyte balance, so clearly they're going to have a problem with that. They very clearly have a problem with temperature regulation because the skin, through sweating and evaporation, helps control our temperature, and you don't get that when you lose that protective barrier. Sensation, pain, touch, pressure, all of that. Vitamin D activation, that one's not near as important. Um, it is good to remember that it's able to regenerate itself as long as we're not completely through the dermis. If it's completely through the dermis with the um, full thickness burns, you can't regenerate skin at that point. And then the other thing is that it gives us our sense of personal identity, how we look. Just a reminder of your layers. The epidermis, the outer layer, it's non-vascular. Burns very rarely bleed. Um, and then remember the epidermis varies in thickness. So like the palm of your hand is much thicker skin than your face, the cheek on your face. So it's going to depend. That's why burns are really actually hard to calculate the severity in real life because we've got these varying thickness and you'll have varying levels of burns. So one area of the burn will be, you know, a full thickness and another area of the burn will just be a partial thickness. Dermis is your second layer. It's important because it has all these things in it, capillaries, nerve endings, the sweat glands, the hair follicles. And then below that, which I couldn't find a good picture of, is sub-Q tissue. So what's important about the sub-Q tissue is it has nerves and it cushions muscles, tendons, and bone. So when we go deep enough in a burn to get to the muscles, tendons, and bone, oftentimes it ends up where they need fasciotomies, things to release that. So this is not everything that happens in a burn injury, but some of it, kind of as much as I could at the high points. So once you have that burn, you have an immediate release of catecholamines. What do catecholamines do to the body? What happens to your heart rate and blood pressure? They, they both increase with the release of catecholamines. So just from the injury itself, the body will automatically increase the heart rate and blood pressure, and they do that through vasoconstriction. Well, when we have vasoconstriction, we don't have good blood flow. And that's happening because of the injury itself, the stress response, really fight or flight. We have increased capillary permeability. So with the increased capillary permeability, it causes massive fluid shifts. And so in that emergent period, the first 48, 72 hours, we're having huge fluid shifts where fluid is being pulled out of the vessels and into the interstitial tissues third spacing. And the problem with third spacing is it creates this horrible edema, but it's fluid that can't be used. So you look fluid overloaded, but you're actually hypovolemic because you have unusable fluid. So this happens very quickly after the burn. So this is our big focus in the emergent phase is fluids. Um, the other thing is when we get this fluid, that's also the lungs. So you have increased capillary permeability in the lungs too. So that will then fill the lungs with fluid. We get pulmonary edema and all the risks inherent in that. And then that affects our fluid and electrolytes. So sodium will be out of whack. Potassium will be out of whack. After the first two, three days, then the fluid shifts back. Back out of the tissues, back into the vessels and you start getting rid of that edema, but once the fluid shifts, we have problems again with sodium and potassium, urine output, anemia. So we're really hemoconcentrated at the beginning, and then we become hemodiluted, so that'll mess with anemia. 
You have decreased perfusion to the GI system. That happens because blood is needed elsewhere. So when, when the body vasoconstricts with that release of the catecholamines, it's sending all the blood to the heart and brain. And so it will shunt blood from other places, and the GI system is where it shunts from. So when we don't have blood flow to our GI system, we're at big risk for paralytic ileus, get abdominal distension, constipation, and then do you remember curling's ulcer? So it's just like a stress ulcer. Yeah, it's just a stress ulcer, but we get stress ulcers from hospitalization, from this huge stress to the body, so they need to be on protein prompt. Proton pump inhibitors, H2 blockers, Zantac, Pepsid, that kind of stuff. And we'll talk about what we do with each of these. I just want you to quickly see the A and P. Um, then from all the cell damage we have from this burn itself, the body, those re damaged cells release byproducts like myoglobin, potassium, so we get high potassium levels, We'll get kidney damage or ATN, acute tubular necrosis, an acute kind of kidney damage that can lead to failure because we have so many products released. It makes the urine have more stuff in it and it gets stuck in the kidneys and then your kidneys don't work as well. We have a huge inflammatory response, right, from the damage. So remember, inflammatory response is not the same thing as immune dysfunction necessarily. It doesn't, it, when we have an inflammatory response, it doesn't mean that we have an infection. You don't have an infection at the beginning of this, but you have a huge inflammatory response because you have a big damage to the body. So that inflammatory response stimulates the white blood cells to go work and more to produce, and eventually we kind of use that up so that that immunosuppresses them a bit. And then we also destroy that protective layer, the skin, so huge, huge risk of infection and particularly sepsis. With this injury, we also have a huge demand on the metabolic system. So we have catabolism going on in the body. We're losing protein from all the wounds. Um, and just the body's response to keep that heart rate up, the blood pressure up, to do all the work of healing, you need a huge amount of calories, more than most people can take in, 5,000 calories a day. And if you don't have good nutrition, can you heal? You can't heal wounds, and that's what we're trying to heal. And it keeps your immune system down so that it all kind of works uh, against each other there. So we need lots of protein, lots of calories. And that's from the very, very beginning. You don't wait days to feed a burn patient. You start feeding them immediately. Um, usually because of the insult of the burn, usually um, with, you know, NG tube, enterally. And then, again, with the damage, the RBCs, the red blood cells are hemolyzing that causes hemoconcentration. So if we have concentrated fluids because we're already hypovolemic, they'll have a falsely elevated hematocrit, hemoglobin, but the bigger problem is it increases the blood viscosity, so the blood gets kind of sludgy, um, and then that puts them at risk for things like DVTs, PE, that kind of stuff. So there's kind of a quick and dirty A and P of burns. Types of burns. Um, so I just gave you some pictures because I think you remember better when you have pictures. So thermal burn is what we typically think of with most burns. Scalds, um, putting our hand on something. I'm going to describe each of them, but I'll show you the pictures here. Chemical burns. Chemical burns can be from inhalation and then you have burns in your lungs or it could also be, you know, from contact. But they do weird things to the skin depending on the chemical. And then smoke inhalation, trying to find pictures of this is impossible. But we'll talk about carbon monoxide poisoning and then just airway damage. So anytime you have smoke inhalation then you've got big potential for airway problems that can crop up a little bit later, not immediately. 
And then electrical burns. So electrical burns, you have an entrance wound. You often have an exit wound. And even worse, you have extensive, horrible tissue damage inside. So here's each of them with just the key things because they like to see if you understand the key things with the different types. So thermals are, again, your most common. Not anything particular you need to know about these, um, although many times they require escherotomies. So escherotomies is when we cut into the eschar, which is the dead tissue, to release pressure. And we do that, especially if they've got, um, like, here's an example. See how burned he is on his chest? If you have a burn on your chest all the way around, that's a circumferential burn. Same thing if you have it on an extremity, a leg, an arm, where the burn is all the way around. When that massive swelling occurs, what happens? Yes, we compress the vessels, we compress the nerves. So we'll have all those circulation problems, those six P's, pulselessness, pallor, pain, all that stuff because we're not allowing any blood flow because of the edema from those circumferential wounds. So what they do is literally just slice them. You can see it here. Slice on each side to allow pressure to expand. Otherwise, you wouldn't have blood flow and you'd lose the, lose the extremity. If it's chest, they got to release that because, and they'll release it on the sides. It's like they just put, you know how that mannequin in the sim lab has zippers on the side? That's what it's like. They're going to just cut right on the sides to allow expansion. Otherwise, your chest can't expand. So you just get constriction of the chest. You can't breathe. And that can happen with any, not just thermal burns, but any of them. So chemical burns, you can have acids or alkalis or any kind of organic thing, but alkalis are worse than acids. So I used to have a lady come do this burn lecture from the burn center, and she gives an example of a guy who is putting down fresh cement, and it got inside his boots. Well, cement is an alkali, so it doesn't burn he didn't realize that he had this cement in his boots until he took his boots off and his feet were completely eaten up. So the alkali liquefies the skin. So it's worse even though it doesn't have the burning sensation like an acid. And then they can also cause systemic problems from the chemicals themselves. So a couple of things specific to chemical burns. Um, you have to decontaminate them before you can care for them because you don't want to get chemicals too. So if they have dry chemicals on them, you brush it off with a dry brush because there are some chemical reactions that can happen with dry chemicals and water. So you brush the dry chemical off and then you try to dilute all chemical burns with water. So we want to dilute it with as much water as we can to stop that tissue destruction that's occurring. This don't use neutralizing agents is if you don't know what the chemical is. If you, know, if you can identify the chemical, you call poison control and you find out the correct neutralizing agent. But just using a basic neutralizing agent on anything can have disastrous con consequences. And then she always tells a story, so I just, you won't be testing on it. I think it's interesting for you to know because we have so much meth production everywhere. They use white phosphorus in meth production. White phosphorus, and you know, there's a lot of explosions in meth production facilities. So white phosphorus actually embeds in the skin, and when it's exposed to air, it ignites. So they will catch on fire if they have white phosphorus on their skin. So it's really important you dilute with water and leave wet towels on them because as soon as the air hits that white phosphorus, it actually burns. Catches them on fire. Smoke inhalation injuries. This is commonly asked too. Okay, so I'll, well, let me explain it and then I'll tell you how the question's asked. Any burn of the head, neck, or chest, you have to assume they might have a smoke inhalation injury which means you're going to watch them very closely for respiratory distress. Or a burn that occurs in a closed space. The way the questions are usually asked is something like, 
Uh, you've got a patient who has a, a burn on his chest, and then I'll say, what are you most concerned about? You're concerned about respiratory status um, because of the potential for smoke inhalation injury. Also, if it has any of these symptoms, singed nasal hairs, hoarseness, coughing, airway redness, sore throat, or sputum that has black in it. Any of those symptoms in a question, respiratory is your focus. Because they may be okay right now, but they can very rapidly decompensate. And what will happen is airway swelling. If I have airway swelling, can I put can I intubate them very easily? Nope. So if I can't intubate, what do I have to do? Trach. And that's not very controlled in an emergency. So we don't want to get to that point. They're going to intubate them before that happens if they have a lot of these symptoms. They're going to try to intubate them before it's an emergency. Um, very common cause of mortality. In fact, it's why a lot of people die at the scene is smoke inhalation. Um, if they have chemical exposure, they can get a lower airway injury. So if you have a low airway injury like your alveoli or down in the bronchioles, that's when you can get pulmonary edema and adult respiratory distress syndrome. So again, you'd, you'd watch for those symptoms. But the questions are usually asked about this stuff at the top. Um, all patients with a chest injury or higher, we're going to put on 100% humidified oxygen by mask, no matter what their SATs show, because of the potential for this, and then do frequent respiratory assessments. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Again, if they are in a house, they have a potential for this. So the symptoms, look at this great picture. Cherry red skin. So I put the cherries there so you'd remember that. But this is a perfect picture of the skin color. So they come in very bright red. And that cherry red is actually from vasodilation. So the hemoglobin can't carry the oxygen like it's supposed to. So when they draw labs, they'll, it'll show carboxyhemoglobinemia and hypoxia. I mean, you can tell that by getting a sap, but it's the skin color and the treatment. Put them on oxygen, 100% oxygen, and then there's other treatment we do. Um, I'm going to say this a couple of times, but burns do not cause unconsciousness. People should be alert. If they're unconscious, they have another injury. So either they have carbon monoxide poisoning or they've fallen during the burn. They fell and hit their head. They've got a head injury. But a burn itself will not cause them to be unconscious. You've got to look for something else. Electrical burns. So the key with electrical burns, there's a couple of keys. It doesn't look as bad on the outside as it probably is on the inside. So when you get the current, it has heat. And so usually there's an entry wound and an exit wound and it could have zigzagged around between that inside the body. So it's like the tip of an iceberg, what you see on the outside. You expect extensive internal damage. The other thing is the sparks themselves can ignite their clothing so they could also have thermal burns in addition to their electrical burns. Two really important facts. You have to assume all electrical injuries have a C-spine injury because the contractions that that jolt of electricity can cause are strong enough to break bones. So every electrical burn needs to be assumed a C-spine injury. So C-spine precautions, taking x-rays. Also, you've got to assume there might be a cardiac problem. So every electrical burn needs an EKG and cardiac monitoring. Then they often end up with kidney problems too, but several specifics for electrical that you should know. The way we classify burns is the depth, so that's that degree thing, first, second, third, or more commonly we hear full thickness versus partial thickness. But we also look at the extent and percent of the total body surface area, TBSA, total body surface area, which is the rule of nines. 
She probably also mentioned like Lund Brower, which is a better, but the rule of nines is what they always test on. And then where is the burn helps us determine severity. And then other risk factors, like is this a healthy patient? I mean, usually this is young people that this happens to, but if it's a person with cardiac disease, that's significant, an older person. So we're going to look at each of these in detail. So burn depth. You can bet there will be a question that describes a burn, and it's going to ask you which is this. Either partial thickness, deep, full thickness, it's going to ask that question. So you need to distinguish between them. So here's pictures if that helps you. But partial thickness, superficial, or what we used to call first degree, is like a sunburn. No blisters at the outset. They could get blisters later, but at when they present, they won't have blisters. It's dry, it's painful because the nerve endings are exposed. It's only the epidermis, so it heals quickly. We don't need to do anything for them, really. Partial thickness deep has blisters, shiny and wet, pain, and it includes some of the dermis. You have epidermis and dermis. Takes a little bit longer to heal. So both of these are painful because the nerve endings are exposed. When you get to full thickness, that means all of the epidermis and the dermis, full thickness, then you could have all sorts of colors. If it says white, dry, waxy, hard, or leathery, and the other key is no pain, it's because we've burned past those layers. So they've damaged those nerve endings already. Full thickness cannot grow new skin. You have to have skin grafts for full thickness burns. And they won't have any questions where it's a combination of things like you would actually see in real life. It would be really, it would give you a description and you need to decide which one it is. I'd be shocked if there wasn't a question of that. I'd also be shocked if you did not have a question about rule of nines. Here's the key. This is only front, this is only back. So if it says anterior chest, it's 18%. If it says the whole chest, it's 36% because you have front and back. That's where you make your mistake most of the time. So the arms are 9% total. The legs are 9% on the front, 9% on the back. Perineum is 1%. Hands themselves are just 1%. But typically, if, if it involves most of the arm, you count it as the 4.5 for the front, 4.5 for the back. So there will either be a picture or there will be a description of where it is. Make sure you don't forget front and back or to subtract if it's only front, not back. So head total is 9%. So there's a reminder uh, and this is just for adults. There's a different rule of nines for kids, which she won't ask you about. You, you'll probably talk about it in peds, but there's a different rule for kids because of the way their body is shaped of a bigger head, that kind of stuff. Uh, this won't matter. This is just FYI. Don't include first degree burns when you calculate, but that, that won't be a problem in the question, I promise. Sometimes if they get to us late, they have so much edema that... It's a guess, and they have to kind of revise it once that edema goes down. And this is an estimate. It's, and it's a good estimate for people that aren't a burn center. The burn center is going to do much more detail to get a really good percent of total body surface area. It's important because we use this number to help us calculate how much fluids they need. So that's why this is so important. Location of burns is important. So any burn to the eyes or face, hands, feet, perineum is considered serious. So I gave you pictures. There's a hand, there's a face, eyes, hands and feet, perineum. It's all blacked out for you. That was a nice Google search last night. I was thinking, oh, I don't need my kids coming here while I'm searching pictures <laughs> of perineums. Um, 
Also, circumferential burns, those burns that are around a body part, arm, leg, chest, anywhere where it's all the way around, are considered serious because of that risk to lose circulation to those areas, and chest because of the risk that you're going to not be able to breathe. It's going to basically act as a tourniquet there. So location is really important. And then the other risk factors we consider are those things I talked about. Older adults have thinner skin, so their burns are going to be deeper. They are slower to heal. They have increased infection risk, so lots of risk with an older adult. Any pre-existing cardiovascular, respiratory or renal disease, any of these things, diabetes, peripheral vascular, because of the huge amounts of fluids we're trying to give them at the beginning, puts them at huge risk because we can overload them a lot easier than a healthy person. Alcoholism or drug abuse, partly because of our risk with detox and all that stuff in addition to all the problems they're having at the burns. Malnutrition, why do you think? Yeah, it's already increased their catabolic demands and now we're going to add more with the burns. They're not going to heal well. And then any additional injuries, so if they have a head injury or they have a C-spine injury or they have broken bones, any other injuries they might have are going to make things worse. And all of these things, all these four things we talked about with deciding the severity of burns help you decide do they need to be hospitalized or not. All right, you do need to understand the phases of burn injury. So the emergent phase is really resuscitative care. Resolve immediate life-threatening problems, secure the airway, prevent hypovolemic shock. This is that big, massive fluid shift. It happens from the time the injury occurs until usually 48 to 72 hours after. Uh, the acute phase starts when diuresis occurs. So during this whole phase in emergent, we are trying to fluid resuscitate them. When they start diuresing, we know that our fluid resuscitation has been successful, um, and that's when they move into that acute phase. And the acute phase lasts until their wounds are closed, either by healing or by skin that we've put there. So that can sometimes take weeks to months. I think the burn nurse said, it, based on their percent of injury, like if they have a 30% total body surface area, you expect to say 30 days in the hospital. That's kind of how they judge it, and just a real rough estimate. So the acute phase, our goals really are to prevent infection. So wound care really occurs more in the acute phase than the emergent. So every time we ask you, you know, what's a risk of any kind of injury, you always say infection. Infection is usually several days down the road. And same thing here. Now, I mean, we're certainly watching that, but we're much more concerned about hypovolemic shock and stuff like that in that first emergent phase. That second phase, it's wound care, preventing infection, getting them ready for PT, and getting on with life. And then rehab is where it really overlaps with the acute phase and starts when they're taking care of themselves, which of course does start in that acute phase too. But the focus, once we get to rehab, is maximal function, adjustment to their limitations, getting independence. So what I did is I took each of the areas and I kind of divided it between emergent and acute. So overall, we've talked about all these. The goal is prevent infection, restore fluid balance. Thermoregulation, because they lost that protective layer, which is how we control our temperature the most, they have a lot of problems with temperature control, so we have to control it externally with room temperature and covers and that kind of stuff. Pain control, of course, is important. New skin integrity. Nutrition is critically, critically important, and then the emotional support. Um... Some of these we haven't talked about, so this is important to know. Pre-hospital, so if you had a burn at your house, what are you going to do? First thing is to stop the burning process. The reason we have people run cold water over a burn, so you burn your hand on the stove. If you run cold water over it, 
It's to take the burning out, to stop the burning so it doesn't continue deeper. So if you put it like in a bowl of cool water, pretty soon that water turns warm and you need to get cool water again because what you're trying to do is stop the burning on the skin. So that's the purpose of the water. If it's a really large burn, we've got to focus on ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. Running that water on a large burn could lead to hypothermia because their body can't adjust. If we get too cold, we shiver, bring our temperature up. You can't do that if you don't have your protective layer. So we do have to be careful. Never ever use ice. That is probably something you may not know and it's because ice vasoconstricts. We already talked about they have a problem with vasoconstriction. We need blood flow to get there so we don't want to add to that with ice. But we can use cold water. Cool water, cold water, but not ice. Um, remove burned clothing. The burn nurse would tell you they don't want you to do too much of that because they don't want you to cause too much more damage. Um, but we do need to get rings and watches off. Why? Because they retain heat. They retain oh. heat, oh, but edema. something else. Yes. Oh. So they're immediately going to start swelling. That's the first response. So if we don't get rings and watches off, it will have to be cut off and it can cut the circulation off so if you were to come across them, eye that's one thing you can do to help is get those things off because people aren't thinking about that at the time if it's a chemical find out what the chemical is so we'll know what the neutralizer is 100 percent humidified oxygen for everyone in case we might have inhalation injury and then if it's an electrical burn EKG as soon as possible now we have each of the body systems and so your book goes through and it covers every body system by emergent and then every body system by acute and a lot of it's a repeat so i just put them both on a slide at once and then you could see if there were any big key differences all right um so cardiovascular big risk of dysrhythmias particularly though hypovolemic shock, circulation impairment from the circumferential injuries, um, venous thromboembolism, and even heart failure just because of the overload we have on the body with the high heart rate, high blood pressure, or vasoconstriction. Escherotomy if we have circulation impairment. So be sure, okay, there's something else you need to know that I remember about burns if you and this is in the emergency section too so if you have a patient that either has like a broken bone or a cast or in this case the swelling from the injury and they lose pulses and increase pain they have all those symptoms of circulatory impairment this is one of those cases where the answer is call the doctor because in this case the doctor needs to do an astrotomy there's nothing you can do if you if you elevate you actually send blood away and we already don't have any blood flow so that's actually a bad thing to do if you apply to ice that's a bad thing to do because it will vasoconstrict to send blood away so the answer is call the doctor when you rec recognize a circulatory impairment um, so the most important thing for the cardiovascular system in the emergent phase is fluid replacement. And we're going to talk about how much in a minute. Also, we want a baseline EKG on every base. So for an electrical burn, you absolutely do EKGs and cardiac monitoring. For everybody else, at some point they want a baseline just to know what's abnormal for them and what's normal so that when we have electrolyte imbalances we can see it on the EKG. Acute phase, not really any different. These, these risks all just drop off a little bit except maybe for DVTs and thromboembolisms. Respiratory care. Typical complications in the emergent phase edema, obstruction, or constriction. So either constriction from that circumferential chest burn or obstruction from swelling in the airways or even swelling deeper in the lungs and pulmonary edema and even respiratory infection 
especially if they kind of came in with it, if they had it before the burn. Um, but remember, these things can happen super quickly, so we have to do very close, frequent risk free assessments. So all of these, wow, look at my typing. All of these things should be things you can think through, most of them. So chest x-ray, ABGs, frequent assessment, already mentioned early intubation. If we have any symptoms of smoke inhalation, they're going to go ahead and intubate them for safety. Escherotomy if it's a chest constriction. Fiber optic bronchoscopy, putting a tube down and looking in the lungs can be done if they suspect smoke inhalation, they don't have real clear symptoms and they want to look down there and see if maybe it's lower airway um, before the symptoms worsen. 100% humidified oxygen, high Fowlers. High Fowlers is really important. Almost sitting straight upright. Turn, cough, deep breathe hourly. What does that do for us? opens up those alveoli, and it moves fluid around, so it prevents atelectasis. Chest physiotherapy, suction, all those things to keep the airway as clear as possible. And they may be intubated you know, on a ventilator. In the acute phase, we still need to do all these things, particularly turn, cough, deep breathe, um, keeping things moving to prevent, but pneumonia becomes their risk because they've been immobile, um, they've got all these injuries, so pneumonia becomes a bigger risk in that acute phase. Neuro, not much to say here other than, again, if they have any neuro symptoms, there's something else going on. So what can change in level of consciousness suggest? It could suggest a brain injury, but let's say we've ruled that out. Uh, don't jump to pneumonia yet, unless it's an old person, but don't jump to that. What did you say? Electrolyte imbalance. Electrolyte imbalance is one of them. Another, hypoxia. So remember, the early signs of hypoxia is change in level of consciousness. Same thing with some of the electrolyte imbalances, particularly sodium. So, if they're having neurosymptoms, if we haven't checked them out for neuro injuries, we should. If we've checked them out, we should think about hypoxia, electrolyte imbalances. In the acute phase, they, for some reason that's undefined completely, they tend to have odd behaviors. And it's probably, I would bet it's probably PTSD kind of stuff, you know, a reaction to the trauma. But oftentimes they need psych assistance in that acute phase. And in a burn center, that's part of their multidisciplinary care. Musculoskeletal, so in the emergent phase, we want to assess for other injuries, particularly if it's what type of burn? Electrical, because it can break bones. We've got to start range of motion in the emergent phase because we don't want them to lose function. And then positioning is critical in the emergent phase. And I've got a slide on that, but splints, getting getting things in anatomic position. When you're in pain, you tend to flex. You draw in. That's a bad thing in a burn. So we wanna control their pain, but not let them be in position of flexion because then they are not as functional later. In the acute phase, it's even more critical because their complications are limited range of motion because they've had contractures or that skin has gotten tight. When we didn't do a good job with that. So really, really important in the acute phase is to get them moving. Ambulation, splints to be in anatomical position, the pressure garments. So after their wounds heal, they put pressure garments over that skin to keep it supple and moving. Sometimes they have to actually go in and surgically release those contractures. But if you think about contractures, think about feet. If your feet drop, you know how we talk about foot drop? You actually can't walk. It doesn't allow you to walk. So it, the reason we want to prevent contractures is because it won't allow them to function. If you get contractures of your hands, now you can't use them. So it's really, really important. This is not just a PT thing. This is a nursing thing to stretch them, 
move, lots and lots of range of motion. Renal and urinary care, much more important in the emergent phase. By the acute phase, they really shouldn't need the Foley. They shouldn't have incontinence issues unless they've had perineal burns where you might have a Foley to keep it cleaner. The emergent phase, they have to have a Foley because they've got to keep their urine output, this is important to remember, at 30 to 50 mils per hour. The only way we can measure that is a Foley. Um, and then we want to watch their labs for renal, BU and creatinine. And so the way we prevent their problems for the renal system is the fluid replacement, which I'm going to show you pretty soon. The big risk is acute renal failure or acute tubular necrosis, which then can lead to renal failure because of the amount of cellular debris and if we don't have good hydration, it kind of clogs the kidneys up. Fluid and electrolytes, again, very, very important in the emergent phase, but also in the acute at the beginning. So for the emergent phase, everyone should have two large bore IV lines and an arterial line. And they will actually put those lines through burned skin. They can't secure them very well, so they end up having to sew them in usually because you can't put tape on the burn skin. But they will put them there because they've got to have access. The burn nurse said they really try to avoid central lines because of the risk for infection. So they try not to ever put them in. Your book says you know, central lines for burns that are big. And the truth is sometimes that's going to be your only choice because of what's burned. LR is your, is your fluid of choice. Warmed. Why would we warm it? Because they can't control their body temperature. They can't control their body temperature. We're losing lots of temperature through this open skin. So warmed LR. They use the Parkland formula. I'm going to show you that. I've never tested on it, but I know people that test on it. And I think you'll probably see it on Hesse and Clicks. Potentially, so you might glance. I wouldn't waste my time memorizing it, but if you can kind of get it in your mind a little bit, it might help you. So we watch urine output. We do not give diuretics pretty much with burns. If they're having, if they're not maintaining their urine output, it's probably because we haven't maintained their mean arterial pressure. You remember mean arterial pressure? From cardiovascular at the very beginning, we look at their blood pressure and you do a calculation of two thirds times one third plus whatever. We care because this tells us about perfusion of organs, particularly kidneys and brain. So we watch that map, and usually they're not having enough urine output because we're not giving them enough fluids. So we don't want to give diuretics, we want to increase those fluids so we can keep their cardiac output up. Diuretics would actually decrease their cardiac output. Would you ever use a diuretic for fluid overloading them with, you know, with her crap holes? Or? Well, potentially, but really the problem typically is third spacing. Okay. And when you third space, you look fluid overloaded. If you look at a burn patient, they're edematous everywhere, unrecognizable because they're so swollen. So that looks fluid overloaded, but they're hypovolemic because that fluid is in third spaces where it can't be utilized. So it's all wasted. It's not sitting anywhere where it can be used. So they look overloaded. They're not typically. And more likely crackles for them would be more like, like pulmonary edema, and like that from the burn. So yes, there's a potential for overload, but that's why they really watch the urine output compared to the intake that fluids are giving. You're just losing so much. Think of the insens insensible losses. Your skin, you have insensible loss through your skin. Well, that's going to be greatly increased because you don't have the skin there. Your lungs, if you're breathing faster, you have more insensible fluid loss. So you actually are losing so much fluids with a burn. Oh. I don't think in the emergent phase they have much trouble with the overload. The acute phase, remember that's where diuresis starts. So they start really getting rid of those fluids and the edema resolves. They get those fluids off. So while the body tries to achieve that homeostasis, 
our electrolytes can get way out of whack. Like sodium can get really low, um, potassium can get really low because you're peeing all that potassium out. So they're going to really watch their electrolyte levels. Here's the Parkland formula. 4 milliliters of fluid per kilogram and then you multiply by the percent of the total body surface area burn. LR, but here's the other key thing. So if your total, you figure out the total volume for 24 hours, you give the first half in the first eight hours from time of injury, not the time they arrived. So if their injury was at 8 a.m., they didn't get to you till 10, you now only have six hours to get the first half of their total fluid volume they need in 24 hours in. Make sense? The second half of the total volume you put in in 16 hours. So you have to calculate based on the total volume how much you're going to run each time. So those fluids are sometimes running six, seven, eight hundred mils an hour. They're running very fast. And again, it's from the time of injury, not the time they arrived. They really don't do fluid boluses. You know how if someone's dehydrated, we're going to give them a big 1,000 mil bolus over 30 minutes. They don't do boluses. They instead calculate formulas. Now, the truth is there's a whole lot of formulas besides the Parkland. That's why I don't have you memorize it. And the burn nurse said you know, they, it changes all the time how they calculate. So this is really not a great rule to use for everybody. It might be more important for you to realize that we give the majority of the volume in those first eight hours and then the next part of that volume in the first 16. So in the first, you know, 20 for the first full day, we're giving a huge amount of volume. GI nutritional care, again, really, really important. So in the emergent phase, blood is shunted away from the GI system. So we have that risk of paralytic ileus and then the stress ulcer. Because of that, if, if they don't have good GI blood flow and the belly starts descend, distending, what are we going to do? What do we typically do if somebody's belly is distending? MPO. MPO. Yes, if their gut's not working, what else? Not so much the fluids as putting an NG down to decompress that. So an NG to pull that stuff out of there. However, as long as their gut's working, they need to be fed early. So again, when people are, are acutely ill, we tend to not think about feeding for days. Feeding in a burn is critical because they have so much catabolism and they desperately need the nutrients. So within hours of the injury, they're going to try to feed them and feed them aggressively. So we can feed people enterally or parenterally. Parenterally will be TPN fed through the vein or through a central line. Which would be better? If the gut is working, we want to do enteral as much as possible. TPN is great, but... It is a huge infection risk because of the amount of sugar in it and it causes liver, it can cause liver damage. So it's a great thing, but it's just awful risky with all the other things they go that they have. So enteral is how we want to feed them, NG tube. Um, high protein, high calorie, they'll use special formulas for them. Supplements, so if they can eat, they want them eating. And then they'll supplement in addition to that. Because, again, they need about 5,000 calories, and that's hard to eat. So everything they eat should be high protein, high calorie, and then supplements to add to that. And then they can even feed enterally in addition to what they can take in orally. We do definitely Prevacid or Prilosec or Pepsi, Zantac to prevent those stress ulcers and test for occult blood because that will tell us about stress ulcers. Uh, in the acute phase, paralytic ileus is still a potential, but also diarrhea, constipation, and even hyperglycemia can be a problem because we're feeding them so much food. They can get hyperglycemia, so they may have to go on insulin for a while. So in the acute phase, 
feed, feed, feed. Give them the PPIs, maybe IV insulin, lots of calories, lots of protein, and avoid TPN. The thing that's not on here that should be is way daily. Especially once their edema goes down. So they want to know when they come in what a normal weight for them is. called a dry weight. Because that edema starts so quickly. By the time they get to the hospital, your weight may not really be any good. So it's important to know what their basic weight is. Skin and wound care. In the emergent phase, not as much a priority. Until you get fluid and that stuff. Um, taken care of unless they have those circumferential injuries that are threatening the limbs. They will try to go ahead and clean and start debriding if they can and definitely elevating burned extremities. But not, and they might start wound care and emergent, but it's not a priority like it is in the acute phase. So these are the common things tested on. Of course, good hand washing. Never share equipment. They clean before between every patient, like blood pressure cuffs, everything. Showering daily, twice a day or more dressing changes where they clean and debride. So debride means they take off the dead tissue um, so that that healthy tissue can grow. So just a reminder how we do it. It's not any different than anywhere else except always sterile gloves to put on ointments and dressings, but non-sterile gloves to remove the dressing and clean. They have open or closed wounds. It's exactly what it sounds like, whether you leave it undressed or dressed. Always gowns, gloves, hat, mask, all of it. All PPE every time they do wound care. Really, every time they interact with the patient, they wear all the stuff. The room has to be warm, again, for that thermoregulation, 85 degrees. So imagine how much you sweat in a burn unit wearing PPE all the time in rooms that are 85 degrees. <laughs> I could never work burns. I'd rather work at McDonald's. <laughs> I, it's, it's a special field for me. I couldn't do it. And then usually they want to keep that wound covered. Um, sometimes they'll do topical antibiotics. They typically do not do prophylactic antibiotics. Prevention. They will only do antibiotics like orally or IV if the wound is cultured and it shows something growing. Otherwise, they, they don't do prevention antibiotics, which is kind of unusual. This very commonly asked on tests. The special skin care areas. Face, you, you've got to be careful you don't put pressure on the face anywhere. And you've got to protect their eyes because the face can get very, very swollen. So eye ointment, artificial tears. Ears, really important. They should never have a pillow. Ears are very sensitive. Um, tissue and you can ruin that tissue with any pressure and a pillow would put pressure on ears. Um, and so they elevate using a roll towel. Same with head and neck. You've got to have the head kind of up for anatomical position but you can't use the pillow. Hands and arms you want to extend not flex and they'll use splints to keep them functional. Perineum it's really keeping it dry and clean. So oftentimes they need a Foley to keep that area dry and clean. And then starting PT very quickly. We're almost done, I promise. <laughs> Procedures, I didn't put a bunch on there. Just enough to kind of remind you what they are. Excision is cutting off like the edges and the dead parts and loose skin, and then grafting would be covering those wounds. So you got to remember that if they have an allograft, their own skin, and so let's say they take it from their thigh, now you have another wound to care for because that creates a pretty significant wound um, where they pull that skin. Big complication after excision and grafting is bleeding, and oftentimes they'll even put topical thrombin or epinephrine to vasoconstrict those vessels and stop that bleeding. It'll be actually in the wound itself. 
and then grass very very fragile so you got to be careful how you move very careful how you remove dressings if you have a fresh graft underneath you don't want to accidentally pull the graft up it sometimes looks like paper sometimes looks it's um, it's like cheese grater they use kind of a cheese grater to pull it off so it's it it's sack that shape she showed slice. you pictures okay nice. the escherotomy is not painful so make sure you know the difference between the fasciotomy and escherotomy. Escherotomy is not painful because the eschar is dead tissue. So they don't do anesthesia, but they will give them sedation and analgesia because it's kind of scary. Look at the pictures that we had up there earlier of escherotomy. That'd be a bit scary. And this is going into subcutaneous tissue only. Fasciotomies are much deeper into the fascia and are painful, and they'll give them anesthesia. But they oftentimes do these at the bedside because they oftentimes need to be done quickly. Sometimes do the OR, but not always. Medications. This is important. Analgesics and sedatives, IV only. They are not absorbing correctly orally because of what's going on in the gut. And they will not absorb IM because of your fluid shifts. So the only thing we give IM is a tetanus immunization, and they try to give that in the ER quickly. Um, and they absolutely need opioids. Morphine, Dilaudid, fentanyl, they'll even give them anesthetic kind of, anesthesia kind of drugs in the burn unit. Antimicrobials, I already told you, are not systemic unless they truly have positive cultures. More likely they use it topically Silver sulfadizing, that's the cream they put on burns. If they have a sulfa allergy, they can't have that cream because it has sulfa in it. Uh, definitely prophylaxis for VTE, so Lovenox, that kind of stuff, and the stress ulcer prophylaxis. Pain management, they have pain from the burn itself, but they also have pain from the treatments we do. The debriding, that's why I can work burns. The debriding is so painful. I can't imagine. So PCAs are pretty common. I put these drugs here. They're not all by PCA, but these are the drugs they typically use. Um, if they didn't have an IV, you'd want to give them like MS cotton that will last most of the day. Round the clock, not PRN. They will have PRN and additional. You should always pre-medicate them before dressing changes because they're horrible, I imagine. And we want to give them the anxiolytics, Ativan, Versed. Can you imagine how anxious you would be in a burn unit? So they definitely need that. And then non-pharmacologic things for sure. Rehab. The most important thing on the rehab is the custom-fitted pressure garments. They like to ask questions about that. So you only wear them over a healed wound. You leave them on all.